Okay, so, so today I'll talk about um, so different experiments with the campus uh, uh, that we're seeing, you know, that including the, this room we're, we're seeing in right now. Um, and so, you know, so, so that's one of the fun things about uh, the research that I do is, I guess, you know, as you see, uh, uh, well, you don't see, but you, well, actually you do see when you have with sensor data, you see the results of uh, the work that you do uh, around you. And, and, and I think that's, uh, that's pretty cool. So, um, so the, the Stanford campus is, uh, is really a small city in the sense that uh, we have, um, so, uh, you know, so, so it's uh, sizable, you know, it's not huge, but it's sizable. Uh, the daily population there is partly people coming in. Actually, that number of 30,000 is more based on uh, electricity consumption of the campus as a whole, you know, and that's roughly equivalent to a 30,000 people city um, in California. Uh, and there, you know, and, and, and as you all know, uh, there are different usages, you know, there are different reasons why uh, people are on this campus. Uh, uh, some people live on this campus, uh, work on this campus, do research on this campus, uh, teach on this campus, you know, so, so, so there are many different things that we do here. Um, one of the things, you know, so, so this is a picture, I think, from the, um, taken from the engineering quad looking towards the main quad. Uh, the way I, you know, so this is more of a schematic uh, for the way that I see uh, this campus and why uh, this is such a great place to do um, both real life and thought experiments, and I'll talk both about real life and thought experiments uh, today over the past uh, um, uh, five or so years at this point. Um, so uh, this campus, you know, you, you've basically got from from the from the point of view of the outside world, you could think of the Stanford campus almost as an uh, as an island, you know, and we're buying uh, gas on an aggregate, you know, uh, uh, in an aggregate way, we're buying electricity. So there's one uh, physically, there's one power power line going. Uh, to the outside world. There are two uh, transformers on campus, one of them that's for the central energy plant that I'll talk about uh, quite a lot today, and the other one is for uh, the 200 or so buildings uh, on campus. You know, and, and so there's one uh, master meter, if you like, there's one electricity bill uh, for the entire campus, um, which means you know, that uh, there's also one, uh, to simplify, you know, there, there's one entity uh, footing the bill. That's not exactly true, but you know, there's the Stanford University, and 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 we've got this uh, depending on how you you know want to see it, either a, a you know very a dictatorial, dictatorial regime or you know or, or communist regime at Stanford where there's you know sort of the the one community decides what's happening for all the buildings you know so that makes makes it a good place to try uh, experiments to test new ideas, and so if you look at um, at this campus so if I start in the in the middle uh, uh, in the m middle bottom of this diagram uh, buildings so depending on how you count. Uh, 150 to maybe 200 buildings on this campus. Um, and uh, the buildings, like the one we're in right now, uh, they use electricity. Uh, they want to have uh, heating, uh, and, and, and that's coming in, in the form of hot water. And they want to have cold water, chilled water for cooling. Um, and the heating and the cooling uh, are, you know, one uh, the, something I'm very interested in here. The heating and the cooling are produced on site at a place called the Central Energy Facility, which is roughly that direction. Um, and you know, and so that, that that's the plant that um, that's the the place that John was talking about uh, just now. In that energy plant, um, you have different types of machines uh, that use electricity that consume electricity. It's almost only electric. There's a bit of gas that we use for heating um, in the winter, but mostly we use electricity um, to uh, produce the heating and cooling. And so these are different types of heat pumps. You know, so the, the basic idea of a heat pump is you put in electricity and you have some. Uh, hot coming in, a hot source coming in, and a cold source coming in, and basically what you want to do is you're making the hot hotter and the cold colder uh, by moving heat from one to the other with electricity. And so we have different types of uh, heat pumps. You know, there are, there are two types of heat pumps. There are uh, conventional electric chillers, you know, uh, industrial chillers, basically, uh, that produce just, oh, well, where we just use the, uh, the cold water and we reject the heat um, to the atmosphere. There are cooling towers. Um, and then there are uh, what are called heat recovery generator, um, uh, heat recovery uh, chillers, uh, where we use both the hot water and the cold water. You know, and so th that's a different type of heat pump. Also, um, you know, what you would call industrial scale uh, chiller, and and you know, and the heat recovery was a big part of the um, original design. But so different options to produce uh, heating and or uh, cooling, um, and then we have uh, some storage. Uh, so big tanks, and if you know, if you've driven or walked or biked uh, uh, next to that. Uh, building, you'll have seen uh, the tanks. That's that's most of the footprint of the building. Uh, there are tanks for hot water and 
Um, Chillwater, I'll show a picture of them in, in just a second. Uh, so they're, you know, uh, cooling towers, and, and there are decisions you can make about when to consume electricity for that plant to send heating and cooling to the buildings. The heating and the cooling is sent to the buildings through pipes. So what we've got on campus is what's called a district uh, energy system. So we've got both a district heating and a district cooling system. And so we've got different uh, systems of pipes going around campus uh, to bring the heating and cooling uh, to the buildings. There's, um, I think for, for each system, there's roughly 10 miles worth of pipes going around uh, campus. And actually in, in uh, 2016, when we upgraded the system, a big part of the upgrade was ripping out uh, the steam pipes. We, we had what's called a, a district steam uh, system before, and we moved to uh, hot water, which is what's uh, typically put in place uh, uh, now. And, you know, and, and, and that, that, so that was a big part of the uh, upgrade. And then so the campus buildings, and then if you move to the left, and so I'll talk a bit about, so actually the part on the left I'll talk uh, more about. I won't talk so much about electric vehicle charging, but, you know, these are other assets, energy assets, if you will, that are sitting under this umbrella uh, that are active. We've got solar uh, on, on campus. There's something like, uh, I think it's three megawatts worth of uh, rooftop solar on the, uh, on the, on the roofs. And then the building of ventilation systems. Uh, so these are big fans in the buildings that blow around air. Uh, those actually consume uh, quite a bit of electricity as well. And and you know those actually we're we're looking at um, in this in this work. So uh, I'll talk in sort of about two uh, two, uh, two two you know two um, pieces of work that are separate, but you know they're really uh, one uh, uh, you know one continuation. The first part of work. Um, was actually mostly done during my uh, a PhD and kind of takes a, a, the supply view of the campus energy system and is looking at uh, planning and scheduling uh, things at the central energy facility, assuming that everything that happens on campus is, you know, uh, one consumer, one demand, uh, uh, one black box for demand that we has to be met. Uh, so I'll talk about that first, and I'll try to um, I'll try to be uh, done relatively quickly with that part because mostly that's introduction to the second part which uh, I, well, I currently find more exciting because that's what I'm working on uh, right now, which is more the demand side of the system, um, which is uh, taking the point of view of the buildings and seeing what can we do inside the buildings to provide more degrees of freedom for scheduling uh, the central energy plant. So the base, uh, so, uh, the, the base decision-making problem uh, that you're dealing with at the central energy plant is about uh, energy operations, is how much electricity do I send to the different machines uh, every hour. R roughly the time scale uh, that I care about here is 20 minutes to an hour. And why do I say 20 minutes? Because that's um, when you talk to the people who manage that building, roughly when they make a change in the machines that they're working with, that's the time for the buildings that's sort of at the other, other end of the loop to start feeling of the change. You know, so, so, so that's roughly the time scale in which you're making decisions, um, 20 minutes to an hour. And uh, you know, the, what they're trying to uh, minimize is the the their electric bill uh, for the aggregate campus, which is uh, the sum of what's going off both those transformers, so uh, the heating and cooling portion of the electricity loads, and then uh, the sum of all the other uh, buildings. And you know, and, and so you're so so you're minimizing your energy costs. And I'll talk in just a sec about uh, how we pay for electricity. And then so your main decision variables are how much you heat water and uh, cool water uh, with each of your different machines. And you also have uh, the opportunity to store water. Um, and then you have constraints on how you operate the different machines. Um, you have one constraint, which is uh, you, want, uh, to give, you want to give people uh, their heating and their cooling. Uh, otherwise, people are not happy. You know, so, so you have a, a demand uh, constraint there. The way we, so the, this, is, this is a bit important to understand what's coming next. The, the way we pay for electricity is in what's called a two-part tariff, where basically we pay uh, a variable price for energy uh, hour by hour. And that, uh, so uh, Stanford's what's called a direct access customer on the California market. So, so we get a price there and we have a, a scheduler that helps us place um, uh, uh, our, you know, our orders for energy on, on the California market. And so we pay a price that, you know, so one component of the, what we pay is variable hour by hour of the day and the price changes. And I think I'll show uh, what that price looks like uh, in a couple slides. And then we also pay what's called a demand charge. And the demand charge is uh, essentially looking at what's the maximum power draw uh, uh, you over the course of the month, and then you pay a price for that. And so, you know, one one analogy for that. Um, so actually, not so long ago, because I remember I, I used to pay my uh, phone like that uh, before. So you know, and, and I'm not so very old, so so it's not so old. 
um, there was uh, when you paid for your phone, you would pay both for um, for speed, you know, so like you know what speed at which you were getting uh, your internet, and then you would pay for the number of minutes uh, that you know you, you got through, you know. So so you pay both for volume. Yeah, I guess that's another analogy. Is water, you know, that's a, a one I like. Is volume and rate. You're paying both for the size of the pipe and how much went through the pipe over the course of the month. Okay, and so mostly you're looking at scheduling. Uh, the building that's in the box uh, on the top red there uh, to meet the demand from the buildings uh, that are through the chill water loop. So one big source of flexibility that I kind of hinted at is, and, and a lot of that work was looking at how much flexibility was there um, in this thermal storage. So this is an area view uh, of, the, of the central energy facility. And so we have two big tanks for cooling, one for heating. One of the uh, one of the things we were looking at in this work was uh, trying to say how, you know, is there an equivalence between this kind of storage and electrochemical storage, which was, I mean, well, it still is, um, you know, a lot of people are very excited about electrochemical storage, and there are a lot of good things about uh, batteries, but, you know, there are also things that are uh, not so good, you know, like they, they, they cost a lot, whereas this is pretty cheap, um, you know, so what are, you know, what are things that are similar and not so similar uh, between uh, uh, electrochemical batteries and uh, uh, this thermal storage. What are the services that you can provide with this thermal storage? That was a big part of this uh, work. So the first thing that we did was to uh, write an optimization program to say I'm going to uh, uh, schedule, you know, make optimal scheduling decisions at the central energy plant, um, and uh, and that's actually a, a, a research, pro you know, a, a replica of the system that's running the central energy plant right now. So you know, so there's an optimization program being solved. Uh, I think they, they update every 10 minutes, actually, uh, the one that they solve in the online, in, in their real version. So, so, so we, have, we, we built a replica for that to say how, you know, if you were paying this two-part tariff, how would you want to make your decisions? And the, uh, you know, the output from the optimization program is what you're looking at here, where the green here is the, to is the electricity that's being consumed uh, by the central energy plant. You know, so that's what we're paying uh, in electricity to get uh, the heating and the cooling. And then the orange line there, that's the uh, total campus load. So that's how much the campus is doing. And the blue is the total. So that's the, uh, that's the master meter. That's what PG&E uh, sees at the end. And the uh, dashed line there, uh, that's the, uh, the price that we, the hourly price we pay for electricity. And there's also a, a fixed component, uh, uh, which is the demand charge. And I think the left, yeah, the left there is a summer period and the, and the right is a, a winter period. And so what you know what, what what this the main message here is that the blue is trying to be as flat as possible you know so so and, and that's mostly given uh, the prices that you're paying for the demand charge and for uh, the variable energy price there is you know you, you kind of do want to try to shift consumption if you can to when the price is more expensive and, and you see a bit of that happening here but really uh, you know the the game is look at when uh, the uh, the buildings are consuming power and try to schedule the heating and cooling when the you know, when the buildings are not consuming power so that the aggregate is as flat as possible and that you don't pay so much of a demand charge you know that that that's mostly what this is trying to do there and 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 actually you know I, I think this is one of the big um or at least now not so much but at the time one of the big revenue streams that people were trying to get in all the company the startups that were doing uh, electrochemical storage you know and 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 uh, trying to provide services a big part was this what they, and i think they called it uh, demand charge management, you know, was, was this, you know, so you can kind of do the same thing. And that's what the campus is doing right now with, uh, with this thermal storage. Then uh, a second question that we asked, you know, is, so is the, the, this was not so much just about uh, what's the, the cheapest thing to do, but also, okay, if we start to say we want to make decisions um, about uh, carbon, you know, and so here we had a, a proxy for, uh, for if, if Sanford were to pay uh, a, or were to self-impose uh, a carbon price, you know, if, if we start to price in carbon in our decisions, and um, and uh, uh, and and the plot on the plots on the right there are showing what are called. So I won't go uh, into that too much. I'll talk actually a bit more about that on on Thursday. Um, uh, but uh, uh, average emissions factors and, and marginal emissions factors, uh, you know. But but so so basically, I guess the the main message from that uh, plot is uh, already today and increasingly in the future, uh, we can expect that electricity will be uh, cleaner during the day in California than it is at night. You know, so one of the things we'd like to do is to shift uh, uh, electricity consumption towards the middle of the day. And what you know, what the the plot on the left is is saying is 
um, by, by having electric, a fully electric system, there's sort of two benefits uh, to Stanford if you're looking at Stanford's operating emissions for heating and cooling. One is, well, as the grid uh, gets cleaner, well, you know, sort of uh, uh, automatically uh, the carbon footprint of Stanford is going to go down because the electricity we're getting is just cleaner. And that's, that's you know, the cleaner grid here. And then the second is, and, and this will be especially true if we start moving towards a world where there's a big difference between the day and the night, well, then uh, it's going to have more value to do this sort of uh, uh, shifting of uh, throughout the day. Uh, you know, and, and that's something that you can do actually really well with this thermal storage. And so you know, just to, to reemphasize that point quickly, so he's here I'm showing you, uh, so what I'm calling grid imports are basically everything that Stanford is consuming uh, from the outside. You know, so, so this is the total electricity that Stanford is getting. And so on these heat maps, every uh, every column here is a day of the year, and every row is an hour of the day. And so you know, this is sort of showing you a full uh, schedule for a, a, a year of what Sanford would be taking. You know, in, in this what-if scenario, we're we're paying for uh, for carbon. And and the left there is um, so the left that uh, BAU that's business as usual. You know what what you would do if you you know sort of uh, uh, had perfect foresight. You know everything that was going to happen for a full year. And you're just paying for the regular price for electricity, and you know most of that is sort of a, uh, is a color that's as close to uh, as possible to the same thing because it's trying to be flat. And you can kind of see uh, the different months are different uh, shades, and then in the afternoon, uh, you're, you know that's when typically the price uh, uh, was more. So this was back in 2018. I actually don't know what it looks like now, but you know there are sort of two two peaks during the day for the electricity price. So you're trying to lower consumption uh, there to pay a bit less. And then uh, the right side, you know, that would be, okay, I'm just, you know, I just care about carbon and I have this proxy signal for what's the carbon intensity of the grid. And I'm just trying to, uh, you know, minimize uh, uh, my footprint uh, based on that. Well, you know, and, and then uh, basically, so, so if you like, this is also one way I was looking at these was as a way of saying, uh, if you wanted to say Stanford wants to absorb as much solar power as it could, you know, what's the size of a solar plant? On, on campus where we could just absorb all of that solar power in the middle of the day, well, that's roughly what the plot on the right is telling you. So a second uh, question, so, you know, that, that was mostly a thought experiment because we, we uh, Sanford doesn't uh, self-impose a, a carbon price. Um, so a, a second type of, you know, type of experiment that we did that was very much in the real world was saying, can you provide some flexibility to, uh, uh, to PG&E to, to, or to the California market? Can you provide some services to the grid? This is another thing that people want to do uh, with batteries. And so we took uh, a real world pro uh, program, uh, which is PG&E's, um, uh, uh, so PG&E is Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, their capacity bidding program. Uh, and so I'll, I'll use the acronym CBP. And, and basically the game there is um, every month you have to uh, tell, so it's actually uh, 25 days before the start of the month, you have to tell PG&E, um, I'm going, this is how much capacity I can give you. And that capacity is measured in uh, kilowatts or in megawatts, so it's power. And then uh, as you go through, so you, so you make that promise to PG&E, I can be available for uh, five megawatts this, uh, this month. And then as you go through the month, basically um, what PG&E can do is they can tell you uh, up to, uh, I think it was 2 p.m. every day, uh, tomorrow I'd like you to give me that uh, flexibility for a certain number of hours. And there, there are constraints uh, to how many hours they can call or how many times they can call for the month, how many hours they can call each day, uh, things like that. But, you know, mostly the idea is you say the power and then they tell you tomorrow, I want you to give you that for two hours or three hours or four hours and so forth. And so there, there are two problems that we were looking at uh, uh, to participate in this program. Um, the first one is, is more of a planning problem. And that, that that's actually the, uh, the work that we did before the summer uh, to try to convince the, the energy operators on campus that it was worth participating in, in this program. And the planning problem um, is more about offline decisions is, you know, before the month even starts, uh, how much capacity can I uh, provide? You know, and so, so uh, we did a bit of work on that. And, and we used a, an approach that's called um, two-stage uh, stochastic programming, where, you know, the, the basic idea there is in the first stage, uh, I make decisions about uh, what's happening uh, in the second stage, which is uncertain. So I have different options for what can happen next. What's the decision I make now so that um, on average or uh, in the worst case, uh, I, I, I make a, you know, that decision is good given the possible futures. And then 
uh, there was an operational problem, and this one we had to uh, do, well, because in the, during the experiments there was a screen in the central energy facility uh, giving recommendations to the, the energy operator, so it was pretty important that we get that part right. Um, uh, you know, the programming had to, had to run. Um, the second one uh, is about as you go through day by day, how are you making decisions to the machines, uh, given that every day up to 2 p.m. they could call you for the next day? And, and, you know, and so, so there, there are decisions to make about uh, the storage. You, you don't want to be uh, empty when they call you, basically. And, you, know, and, and you, there, you can always assume there's a certain probability that they may call you or, or not, uh, or, you know, or that you might run out, uh, things like that. And so there we were using a technique called uh, model predictive control, uh, which is a, um, which is a, so I won't, I mean I can go more in detail in, in the questions if there are some, but is basically at, at every time step uh, you sort of make a plan uh, for the future, uh, then you 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 solve uh, to, uh, an optimization problem saying what should I do if that plan is true, and then you implement uh, the first step of that plan, and then you move forward to the next time step and you you rinse and repeat. So we 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 developed uh, software for both problems. Um, and, uh, and and you know and, and, and this was deployed uh, uh, live I think I said and and the the bottom left there that's a a picture that's that's coming from uh, well so this was made after the fact to show what had happened uh, so that the the picture is similar to what the the one that you were sh uh, shown earlier where the green is what the central energy plant is consuming uh, the orange is the campus and the um, the blue is the total campus load and the 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 parts I've uh, marked out in, in sort of that pinkish color there, uh, those are three uh, live events in July of uh, 2018. Uh, so I think the first one was a three-hour event, the second one was a one-hour event, and the, and the third one was a two-hour event. You know, and so and in this case, I think they could call you up to five times per uh, per summer. And so that was a particularly hot period where you know they sort of three days in a row they said, uh, "Can you can you give us some flexibility tomorrow?" And you know, and and so. So this worked pretty well. Uh, you know, one, one of the one of the nice things is that uh, Stanford made a, a bit of money out of it. So, so that also, uh, on the research side, uh, uh, bought us some goodwill uh, to do some some more work, which was always nice. Um, uh, to give you a sense of scale, uh, we were participating with five megawatts uh, of capacity. Th those were the bids that we were uh, placing, which was conservative given our uh, the the two stage stochastic program that we've been solving. You know, that that we, we that we thought that's something we could do, and and we were. Uh, able to do in, in practice. Um, one of the uh, you know, one of the good things about it is that flexibility is actually pretty big. You know, we, we we were big participants in that program with a relatively small number of machines. You know, the, the number of machines you control at the central energy plant that's actually pretty easy compared to some of the things that people want to do. You know, like it's, it's like if you compare uh, controlling the, the the machines in that plant to uh, I'm going to control a million fridges. You know, it's much easier to do. This, you know, for for a relatively big uh, uh, size, you know, so so that that was that was that was nice to see. Um, one of the uh, one of the other, you know, takeaways for me was um, it, it, there's actually a lot of work to get something like this implemented, you know, and, and if we wanted to get this baked into the uh, industrial software that's running the system, well, you need to get uh, Johnson Controls to, which is the the company uh, uh, that's making the software for the system right now, to integrate it. But they would want to do this if it makes sense to, for them to sell it to their other customers, which might be in different tariffs. You know, so 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 there's um, there there are barriers to uh, adoption. You know, that uh, of these kinds of programs that we we saw firsthand, and and uh, yeah, I can talk more about that in, in the questions. But but that that was very interesting to me. So uh, so if there's one uh, key learning for me from the. Uh, uh, from that, that first part, you know, when we're, when we're looking at thermal storage and what can thermal storage do, um, it was that uh, district-scale thermal storage um, provides complementary uh, services to electrochemical storage. Uh, and, and the reason I say complementary is because um, you can't go as fast. You know, the, the, with, with electrochemical storage, you can get sub-second uh, responses. Uh, there are a lot, you know, on the power side, there, you can move things very fast. You can do things like frequency regulation. Uh, sort of a wide array of services, but then on the if you on the energy side, uh, uh, thermal storage you know much bigger, much cheaper, uh, uh, slower yes, but also in many ways easier. So let me just yeah okay I'm about right. So then uh, the second part actually maybe let me stop and drink a bit. Are there any questions? 
Okay, so either no one understood or was, I was perfectly clear. Okay, so then, uh, so to move sort of fast forward to more uh, current day work, um, if I go back to my picture of the, of the campus energy operations and how I schedule it, uh, a big part of what I'm going to talk about next is about if we start having decisions that we can make inside the buildings, uh, can those uh, add value? Or, or maybe a better way to say that is, uh, would having decisions in the buildings uh, give you more value than the cost to implement those uh, decisions? And you know, both in terms of actually doing it, because you know there there's some, there's a cost to to just uh, implementing uh, uh, things, and also in terms of cost to uh, uh, say occupants. So uh, DR there stands for demand response. So I'm looking at my original decision making problem uh, from the central energy facility, and and really here what I'm looking at is. Uh, what if I sort of added, you know, another screen, another lever or set of levers that they could pull in that building, saying I'm going to do things inside the buildings, and that's what I'm generically calling uh, demand response. So I'm going to pay a cost for that, um, and and in terms of what's happening there, and and the types of so there are two types of decision variables I want to add into my uh, problem there. There are uh, thermostat set points. So I want to control. Is there one? I don't see the one for this room, but so so in, in many rooms um, uh, uh, in the buildings on campus, uh, on the wall, you'll see a thermostat. So so we can actually connect to those um, and uh, and send commands. And those are more sort of uh, uh, well, one they're continuous uh, decisions, and they're if you know what you might call soft uh, uh, demand measures. And then I, I always have the option to uh, just uh, walk to a building and shut off the valve. Uh, for the, the water that's going to the building and, and just disconnect it completely, which is going to have higher costs, but is is pretty reliable. You know, you, you know that if you do it, it just turns off. Um, and then, uh, so if I look at my constraints, so I still have the constraints I had before. Uh, now when I'm looking at satisfying loads, uh, I'm looking at uh, that problem on a building per building uh, basis now. Um, and uh, so there, there's somehow I'm going to have a, a, a state uh, equation somewhere that's saying, uh, well, if I don't give a building cooling, it's going to get hotter, and so I might pay for that uh, down the road. So, so I, I need to start tracking more things. And so I'm, I'm keeping what's, uh, you know, the decisions I want to make at the central energy plant. I'm just looking at adding uh, more of these decisions. So uh, to start, you know, to, to start planting a seed for why could this be valuable, uh, and, and, and there are actually several different ways in which we think it could be valuable to have uh, decisions at the uh, central energy plant. One of them is to think about our capacity needs, and and I think I have a picture, yeah, in the next slide uh, where I'll, I'll I'll show what happened during those events. But w part of the motivation for launching this program, uh, John mentioned, there were there were uh, supply issues uh, on campus. So so actually first in 2017, but not many people heard about that. Then in 2019, and there are a lot more people heard about that. And, and in 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 many in some ways that was. Um, that was not only, but it was a capacity problem. It's sort of, it's, uh, uh, you have a certain amount of cooling you can produce uh, uh, every day. And, and there we, we ran into, uh, so in the first one was a period of two hot days uh, where uh, we just couldn't produce enough cooling. And so we had to uh, do the chill bar curl the, you know That second variable I talked about, uh, operators went and, and shut things off. So one of the first questions is, well, can I reduce loads on the very hot days um, reduce my needs for cooling, and, and if I can, well, I have to buy fewer machines, and that you know that's sort of uh, a home run because it means less in terms of costs, um, less in terms of carbon, uh, uh, in terms of space, just in, you know, in a lot of different things. And so the plot on the right there, that's uh, that's plot that uh, Ryan in the back there made, and is uh, is data from uh, I think 2020, if I'm not, is that 2020? Yeah, 2020. So that, but but I think it's more uh, conceptual what I'm trying to get out of it here. This is what's called um, uh, a load duration curve. So what it's showing is uh, every uh, uh, every day of so you know 30, 365 days there every day of the year. What was the total campus uh, cooling load? And then it's sorted uh, left to right from uh, maximum to minimum. And what what uh, one of the reasons people make these curves is to look at how peaky they are on the left. And the peak here, the curve, roughly uh, the more value there is for doing demand response because if you can. Uh, reduce uh, demand from the buildings on a certain number of, you know, on uh, so here on uh, five days, well, you have 10% less capacity than you need. If you are, have 15 flexible days, uh, well, 
uh, you can get 20% reduction in capacity needs. You know, so so that that's uh, that's that's uh, uh, that's actually a lot of money. You know, in, in the in the Stanford case, if you can reduce capacity needs by this amount, what this plot is not telling you anything about is how do you get uh, the five flexible days, and you know, and, and is that uh, something that's easy or not to do? And you know, and so so a big part of of this um, this project, you know, the, this cooler project is about uh, well, how do you how do you do this? You know, okay, so from this plot. It looks like there's uh, there's potential for this, but if you wanted to do this, you need to uh, you need to make some decisions, uh, or to be able to make some decisions uh, locally, you, know, you need to be able to pull uh, triggers inside the the buildings, and you also need to uh, make decisions uh, centrally at the central energy plant. You need to decide whether to call on these or not. So, so why you know what 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 is this uh, what is this about? You know, so so my catchphrase for this pro project is that it's about making large, modern buildings, what we call commercial buildings, so typically like the one we're in right now, uh, more energy efficient, flexible, uh, and low carbon. Um, so if I think about, you know, the so, so I do want to highlight this because uh, when you're thinking about managing buildings, there are multiple, you know, there are multiple different things you could do. There are some constraints, some research constraints that we're uh, imposing on ourselves here. Uh, one of them is that we're not looking at new buildings. We're looking at buildings that already exist. Um, and uh, the reason, one of the reasons to do that is that buildings are around for a very long time. I think the, the number from the uh, commercial building energy consumption survey in the US is uh, one to 2% per year is roughly the turnover. Uh, so, and and they're, they're, I mean, buildings are, are roughly there for at least 50 years. On this campus, many of them are, have been here for more than 50 years. So buildings don't change that often. That, that's one reason we want to look at existing um, buildings. And wh what are we trying to do? Uh, we're trying to build uh, uh, methods that can learn from real data. So a lot of this is about running experiments. And I'll show some experimental data uh, uh, today. And then build some modeling methods to be able to learn uh, from the methods and to relearn uh, the, the, the behavior of the buildings uh, day after day. So why, why, why do you care about that? Um, so even though the buildings are around for a very long time, uh, the way that they're used changes um, in at least two ways. So the bottom left there uh, is uh, things can happen inside the building that will modify uh, its behavior. And it can be uh, a retrofit, like a uh, HVAC. So um, HVAC is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. An HVAC system retrofit, well, that, that'll change. And that's the example. Uh, so this is the Wallenberg building. Um, that, that's an example here where the red is the before the retrofit. And the, the y-axis there is, is giving you a sense of what the cooling load inside the building is um, on a weekly timescale. And so the the left is before the retrofit, and the and the red uh, sorry uh, the red um, is before the retrofit, and the right uh, that's that's supposed to be green um, is after uh, the retrofit, and so you can see that well the building consume less energy. What's not so apparent here is is actually even the the uh, the patterns uh, the daily consumption patterns of the buildings changed before and after. But another uh, example is so I can't remember which building, um, but it is there was a. a uh, the, the building was designed with the assumption that the windows were going to stay closed, and then at some point uh, uh, that was changed. Uh, the windows were now allowed to open, uh, but you know you're not going to rip out the HVAC system for that. So somehow, uh, uh, you know that that's something we want to adapt to. So all these are sort of are things that are happening uh, year over year or day after day, and then there are uh, events, and we want to be able to adapt to these. And so uh, a big example for those is uh, are these curtailments. Uh, that I talked about in 2019, and the plot on the bottom right there is showing uh, is showing these uh, these curtailments in uh, June of 2019. So the the first so basically the first day was okay, and then there were two days that were very hot with temperatures up to 100 uh, plus Fahrenheit, which for for Stanford is a lot. And then the third day uh, there were also there was also pain. Uh, people were also unha unhappy on campus, and uh, but it wasn't so hot. And the black curve here is the cooling that was actually measured coming out of the central energy plant. And the blue curve uh, was done by me and is a, a sort of a, a reconstruction, if you like, of what, what I think the buildings would have liked. So if, if, if you'd given the buildings everything they wanted during uh, those heat waves, how much they would have consumed. And so uh, uh, to a first order, the, the difference between the blue uh, um, and, the, and the black here is pain. You know, the, the, this is why people weren't happy. You know, and so you can kind of see here on the second day, uh, it's much flatter. You know, basically what's happening behind the scenes there is on the first day, uh, all of our storage uh, ran out. You know, and, and so and at the at, during the night, it was too 
uh, warm, so we weren't we're, we were still trying to cool the buildings down. We weren't able to replenish our stock of cold water, so we started day two uh, with very little water or very little energy in the tank, if you like. Um, and then uh, the reason the second day is kind of uh, flat there, uh, flattened off, is there were um, there were people uh, from the CEF running around campus and and actually physically turning these valves to disconnect buildings. And so, you know, so I don't know how many how many people were on campus in 2019. Okay, actually a fair amount. So yeah, so so uh, I don't know how many people were, or, or I guess in in June of 2019 is, is really the kind of time I care about. But you know, if so, if you were there and um, well, you probably remember the emails. Uh, in any case, so you know, so so the difference between the blue and the black is, you know, is my explanation of why you got all those emails, why people were angry, um, and so one of the questions we're looking at here is, uh, uh, can we do things differently? In in the short run, uh, so that that committee that John was talking about, what what they decide to do is. Uh, to buy more capacity, you know, to buy more machines so that, uh, uh, you know, the idea was so that this never happens again. But of course, you know, the campus keeps growing. Uh, we're going to have to retire uh, capacity there. So this this entire project is looking at, uh, is there another option? Uh, instead of going and, you know, and shutting uh, shutting down the valves inside the buildings, uh, can you do things that are um, a softer, you know, sort of in, turn in, in, um, in other words, turn uh, what are binary variables today per building into continuous variables, you know, so instead of zero or one, I want to have a zero to a hundred uh, kind of variable that I'm uh, tuning down inside the buildings. And I also want it to be uh, a more um, uh, uh, spatially precise. You know, I want to be able to uh, shut down certain parts of the building and not the entire building at once. To one of the issues that the campus has today is that, um, is that if you have uh, one uh, critical room inside a building, well, the entire building becomes critical. So if you have uh, the, uh, the, you know, if, if you have the option of doing uh, distributed uh, uh, temperature adjustments, well, you can uh, work around that. So that's, that's one thing we're very interested in. So, and I need to start. Okay, I'll go quickly on this uh, uh, because I want to talk about some, some experiments we did, uh, but I can come back to it later. Um, so one one thing that was fun uh, to look at, well, I don't know if fun is the right word, interesting to look at, um, sorry, I, I tend to use the words like fun, what, what I mean is interesting. Um, I mean, I, I enjoy the research I do a lot, so for, to me, part of it's fun. Um, uh, but uh, uh, here, uh, um, here I, I wanted to talk a tiny bit about COVID, because COVID gave us a, a natural experiment, uh, if you like, where, where people were sent home. So actually, occupancy inside the buildings went down. Uh, for you know, very uh, brutally, you know, you can kind of say exactly the date when this happened, um, and uh, for a prolonged period of time. And one of the things, one of the questions uh, you might immediately want to ask is, well, how much does occupancy affect uh, the energy loads inside buildings? And so, so, so if you look, let's just look at the top three plots there, where the left one is cooling, uh, the middle one is heating, and the right one is electricity. And uh, so that, that's the y-axis, and the uh, the x-axis here are mean. Uh, daily temperature. So, so that's the uh, uh, the trying to see what's the relationship between cooling, uh, heating, electricity, and the temperature it is outside. And uh, so I have 2019, 2020, and 2021. And if you remember, roughly March, uh, so actually the last time I saw John before uh, COVID uh, it was uh, I think March uh, uh, 15th or roughly of 2020 is when you know people started to go home. Um, so. You know, 2020 is, is a good place when this started. And what you can kind of see here is cooling and heating, very little impact. Uh, things didn't change so much. Um, and and there, there are caveats, but to first order, reduced occupancy on campus didn't really reduce our heating and cooling loads, electricity a lot. You know, so, so what one of the things that this sort of tells me is that first order, if I wanted to say tomorrow is a demand response day on campus, let's send everyone home because we really need to consume less energy right now, it would... Imp if, if I did it tomorrow, you know, if I implemented it right now, it would have a big impact on the electrical loads. It wouldn't have an impact on the heating and cooling loads, which, uh, which means there's, there's work to do. And so, um, so the first thing, you know, we did is in 2020, we started running uh, experiments. Back then it was in three buildings on campus where we were changing um, set points. So, so uh, when I say set point, I mean basically the control. So in the thermostat, uh, the control at which it's trying to uh, keep the room. Uh, you know, so, so and, and there's a, typically rooms are uh, controlled to what's called a dead band. So a, a heating and a cooling set point where if you're inside the dead band, the, the energy system doesn't do anything, it's happy. And then if you go above, 
uh, the cooling set point, uh, you cool. If you're below, uh, you heat, or, or something like that. Um, so what we're what we're controlling here is the the temperature dead bands, and we're and and the so the method is controlling the temperature dead band. What we're trying to do is impact uh, the cooling loads in this case uh, inside the building. So in 2020, there are two kinds of experiments we were doing. Uh, we were doing experiments where we were changing uh, those cooling set points day by day uh, and trying to see how much does that impact uh, the building's cooling load. And you can kind of see, you know, why we we thought, okay, this this is there's hope for for doing this kind of thing on the bottom left, where those are showing four days uh, in a building uh, in the uh, over there. This is a mechanical engineering building, um, and these are four days with relatively similar outside air temperatures. Two days where we had a low set point, two days where we had a high set point. You can kind of see uh, the load goes down when you increase the temperature set point. So we thought, okay, good. You know, that this is something uh, that has potential. And then on the right, we were also doing experiments where we were uh, changing temperature, uh, temperature set points throughout the day uh, to try to get a sense for the building response. Because, well, we, you know, we, we want to build uh, models for, for the buildings to see what they're doing. And so... Uh, Oh gosh, I you, know, you really need to move faster. Sorry. Um, so the uh, the bottom right there, uh, those are experiments where we're increasing the temperature set point at noon um, and seeing uh, the building respond. And so here you can kind of see. Uh, so the the middle picture there is the temperatures, and you can see that going up gradually. And it also has a shape, uh, which I like because there's a a physical model I want to put onto this and kind of matches that shape. So so I like that too. And then the the bottom right. That was the campus cooling load, and you can see that drop uh, sharply in this case at noon, uh, which was which was also nice. So a lot of potential. And then in 2021, we did a lot more experiments on uh, double, uh, actually eight buildings, and there are six that I'm taking in here. Um, and so I'll talk more about this. But uh, uh, basically, what did we take from this? Well, you know, there's potential for doing this sort of thing. Um, so we were testing a two degree Fahrenheit set point change. So actually pretty small, and we got uh, uh, a pretty big response, 12 to 29 percent in uh, in the four office and conference buildings, and then uh, labor laboratories, we also saw a response, but uh, smaller. And let me jump through this just by saying, uh, uh, you know, that, that one of the things we saw is, is demand response uh, can be a, a reliable uh, resource. So uh, just to say a bit more about how we were doing this. Uh, so uh, the, the picture on the top left there is sort of a schematic for how a uh, building is operated. So I'm bringing the heating and the cooling from the uh, outside. And there's one place where I extract the uh, cooling from the uh, chilled water, and I pass it to the air, and then I blow it to the different zones. And then inside the zones, I'm changing these temperature set points. So we have a, a, a software system uh, that's talking to uh, roughly 1,000 zones at this point uh, spread across multiple buildings. And so every day I'm changing the set point and seeing how the building responds. Let me jump through this and just say uh, we want to build models uh, on top of this. This this is to kind of give you a, a sense of uh, the data, the sort of data we're collecting. So here I'm showing uh, six different buildings, and each dot on these plots corresponds to one day's worth of uh, data. So the y-axis is um, served cooling. So so this is how much. Uh, the building is uh, is paying, if you like, to keep its temperatures uh, at the set points. And the blue is uh, uh, the low set point. Uh, the red is the high set point. And uh, the lines uh, that I superimposed on these graphs are, uh, are my model, my simple model for uh, uh, how the building is consuming energy. And the, the difference between um, the, basically the, the blue line and the red line on these, on these plots is is uh, flexibility you know that that's how much uh, i get a, that's the re reduction i can expect uh, from changing the temperature set points and so things i like about these lines is uh, well they, they they also capture how things are changing with respect to the uh, outside temperature which is something i was interested in uh, they give me a sense of uh, uh, uncertainty in the building response so when you look at the dots they're not exactly on the lines but but this is something I can measure. I can I can uh, calculate a confidence interval uh, around these lines to say, well, how much do I expect um, the change to be? And so we were able to make plots like uh, like these. You know, so so at the uh, I'm just going to talk about the right part of this uh, slide. 
uh, where the, the top plot is showing you um, flexibility uh, uh, benefits. Uh, so, so the percentage, so, so the, the, this is the percentage impact uh, of the increase in the, uh, in the set point on energy for cooling. You know, and, and again, um, we saw some, some pretty big uh, impacts. And, and maybe this is not, so, so I guess to put things in perspective, when we started this off, there were actually quite a few people who manage the campus who are telling us there will be no impact. You know, like the, the, you, you will change these set points and nothing will happen. You know, so so this this was this was nice because well, for the other people who thought you know this is going to make a difference, well, you can kind of see and and to some extent you'd think, duh, you know, I I, I increase the set point, the building is consuming less energy, but but actually you know and and, and I can talk a bit more about that um, if there are questions. But the way the building behaves is not so simple to model. So saying. If I increase the set point, the building will consume less energy. That's kind of duh. But uh, how much and, and how does that change with the outside air temperature? That's not so trivial, which, which is why uh, these sorts of experiments have value. And then, so let me jump through this. These are sort of conclusions that I think I've talked a bit about. Okay. And so getting towards uh, uh, the end there, and, and then I'll, I'll have some time for questions. Um, so there are still a lot of things uh, we're working on in, in many ways. We've really just scratched the surface. So I wanted to give you a sense of you know where what, what's next. What, what are the sorts of questions we're we're still uh, trying to answer. And um, one of the things, one of the ways we'll try to do this is we're uh, continuing to run experiments. We'll, we'll start in uh, roughly a month, I think, um, for for the 2022 season. So uh, we want to know how do buildings respond to different set points. Uh, so not just the two degree Fahrenheit increase, uh, faster changes. Uh, how about if I only write uh, part of the building at once? This is one of the things that I mentioned earlier. I'm, I'm very interested in uh, to be able to disaggregate uh, uh, the impacts. Um, so I talked a tiny bit about, but the buildings responded differently. Um, so understanding why, what are the drivers for that? Um, the heating, the HVAC systems, uh, it's kind of in the name, are trying to do both uh, ventilation and cooling. Um, and there's some competition uh, in, the, in the requirements between the two. So understanding more about that, uh, what are the so so that uh, that's also something that we're very interested in. Uh, what are the costs uh, of doing this kind of demand response, and how can we measure uh, the costs? So thinking about uh, occupants. Oops. Um, how can we scale? So another uh, piece where we want to learn more about is how to scale uh, the results. So I said there is roughly 150 buildings on this campus. We are only going to be able to test a subset. So we need to have some sort of way of saying. Uh, what do we think the results would be on the larger population? And at, at most, uh, you know, the best we're going to be able to do is some sort of educated guess, but even that educated guess is going to be pretty valuable, both on this campus and, and in uh, other places. How do I take those decisions uh, that I have now inside the buildings and put them into my central uh, uh, decision-making problem? Uh, how, can I, you know, how can I better understand what's happening, especially on the shorter timescales? which as we start moving towards uh, uh, real-time control problems, we're going to need that. The, the daily timescale won't be enough for those kinds of problems. And how do I think about uncertainty? And I'm not going to go through this. And let me just say, well, we have, uh, in, in addition to uh, great students that I had there on the right, we also have some great uh, uh, faculty uh, uh, supporting us and, and bringing a lot of expertise um, on, on uh, because as I, I hope you, you saw, we have uh, a lot of different questions, you know, around these that are, uh, you know, one person is not going to be enough to do this. And okay, and and this is my uh, conclusion slide, so I'll stop here. The last thing I wanted to say, uh, because I do, you know, and I hope it was apparent from everything I've talked about, is none of this would be possible uh, without uh, the people that manage this campus. You know, sort of the invisible people that no one ever sees, uh, that are uh, actually, you know, uh, running uh, the system and who are. Uh, well, they have a vested interest because they want to keep making their system more efficient, but there, there's actually a lot of uh, staff time uh, that's going to running these experiments. And without uh, this sort of partnership, uh, this really good partnership that we have with them, none of this would be possible. So I want to acknowledge them. Thanks very much. So uh, we probably have time for a few open questions. Before we do that, I'd like to turn it over to Melissa for a brief announcement for the class. Um, yeah, just a quick announcement for the attendance sheet. I put a sheet outside of this classroom, so when you're leaving, just check your name, and that's how we'll be tracking attendance um, for the rest of the quarter. Yeah. 
So any questions for Jacques? I know some of you will meet up with him afterwards. Whoops. Uh, let's start here and then all these. Yes. Uh, well, first, I just want to say this is like super, super interesting. I think like, you know, the first thing you learn when you learn about energy utilities is that, you know, really there are only levers on the on the supply side to, to meet demand and, you know, this seems like it could be uh, once taken to scale, just like an incredibly important piece of, uh, of, of improving energy efficiency overall. Um, my question was kind of about that that path to, to scale. Um, so, like, kind of taking Stanford as like a relative outlier in like the level of control that it can sort of achieve, and maybe it's uh, its willingness to like invest in these in these uh, in these research projects um, right now. Like, do you have any sort of rough estimate for like the relationship between what upfront capital investment is required to like achieve these systems versus like the, the energy savings o over time? Um, and then I guess sort of the, the second part of that question is, is sort of like what, what funding structures do you think potentially work? Obviously, you know, government provides a lot of money for, for home weatherization. Like are there, are there um, potential like things you could do with, with government funding here? Um, I guess that's a little broad, but. Okay, so uh, so I have a number, but it kind of caught me off guard, so I don't remember if it's 20 or 30%, but uh, but there's, I, I think, so let's say 25 on average, but that's the, the fraction of U.S. commercial uh, um, floor space that has uh, uh, pr what are called pr programmable uh, thermostats. So, you know, so, so the sorts of controls that we have in the buildings here, that's actually already pretty widespread uh, in the U.S., um, so one of the things that is, uh, I'm sorry. So you're saying software is the real. Thing. Yeah. So 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 here the the so exactly so software is the word I was looking for. Thanks, John. You know that that the the real investment we're talking about here, or at least that we're trying to talk about here, is software. One of the sort of uh, guiding uh, design decisions of this uh, uh, program is we're not installing any hardware. So you know so so there's nothing that I'm installing in the Sanford buildings that was not already there. So yes. Stanford is a place that has more money than most, and so there are uh, quite a lot of smarts uh, that are reinstalled, but not you know not not so far fetched. I, I, I'm actually talking with uh, a campus, University of Michigan, you know, so I'm, I'm talking in different places that don't have uh, uh, you know as or you know not not even just uh, universities that that wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, have as much money as Stanford, but that do have these smarts. Um, so in terms of you know investments, I actually think well by design we're trying to see. How much can you do if you make no investment? Um, and uh, so the, the, in the uh, academic literature, what uh, this kind of work is, is called supervisory control. So, the, so, so what, what people in the buildings industry have been wanting, so um, some academics have been wanting to do for decades is, uh, uh, and, and the, the key word usually here is model predictive control for buildings, is rip out the, uh, the software systems that are running the buildings today and replace that with much smarter systems, kind of like what they have in uh, process engineering and chemical engineering. Uh, the idea being, you know, we're going to do much better. Uh, the idea here is not to do that at all, is actually to say, uh, can I connect to the systems that are already there, just build a software overlay, and with that software overlay, try to do better. So, you know, it won't be as good as if I change everything inside the building, but it's something I can do much, much faster. It's much it's much more scalable. Uh, it's much more, so, you know, in terms of repeatability, um, uh, which I think, you know, and, and that kind of goes to your question about cost. Um, and that's another big design decision in, in the way we're running these experiments. Uh, every single building is different, and every single building has a different uh, set. Actually, it's not one software system, set of software systems managing the uh, what's in there. But almost, you know, virtually every single room is controlled by this, you know, what's the top of the dead band, what's the bottom of the dead band. You know, the, the, this way of controlling the rooms, that's almost universal. So that's why, you know, that's the control decision we're making. You know, almost by design, I'm saying I don't want to control the fans in the building and the vents, you know, and all the different parts. Because even just internally at Stanford, that would be too much work. You know, like the we, we, we were able to write software to talk to, so I said something like a thousand zones across uh, nine buildings. Each of the buildings we're working with is completely different. Um, if I was trying to rip out the software systems, I wouldn't even, you know, be done with the first one. So and maybe just like, you know, one last thing on the governments, you know, I'm hoping these things will pay, will pay for themselves. They're not, you know, like the, the, the idea is not, uh, is really not about investments. Well, these. Yeah, mine was about the zoning. Um, like how could you- The control, zoning? The zoning of okay. the control for the different rooms, because like if it didn't exist before, then how did you add that? 
Like, like if the whole building was controlled as one before, how did you suddenly control a thousand domes? Oh, okay, sorry. So, yeah, um, let me say a bit more about that. So, uh, so, the, so, there was already, so there already was a system uh, to go in and change uh, zone by zone. It's just given, so, well, one, uh, so the, these systems aren't used so much. And so, so basically what, one thing that you, they could do is, you know, you can, uh, uh, they can go in the system and say, you know, I'm going to change free room one or four or, you know, whatever this room is, and then the next one and the next one. But, you know, like there isn't, um, so, so part of this is just a scheduling system to be able to uh, talk to those uh, rooms uh, independently. And, well, there, there is a bit of a, and actually we're, we're, that's something we're, we're working on right now, there is a bit of a challenge with uh, network issues. So, you know, and that, I think that goes to the cost, is the amount of information that the building systems can take once is actually pretty limited. So, you know, so, so there's some work on the software side there, you know, just bandwidth uh, issues uh, because the, the, the systems are pretty old. Um, and uh, so, you know, so, so, so pre-existing, so it's basically we added a layer on top of pre-existing software. But, so, but, but we didn't add controls. We we just uh, uh, made it possible to use the controls. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. One last question up here. Um, I have a quick question about data generation process. So you mentioned that you know if you could get binary variable to move to continuous, or if you could have more spatially precise controls, it would allow you to sort of both, both run more better experiments, but also cre create more useful insight. And I'm curious, sort of what's the barriers for that and Sort of how much buy-ins do you might need to have from operations, and what are the sort of conflicting priorities for that uh, that particular objective? So on the data generation side, yeah. Well, um, we're very data poor, you know. So so you know so so if you think about you know like a, a lot of machine learning type problems, we have very little data here because you're right, uh, you know, or I think that that's what you were saying. Uh, the uh, the operational sequences in the buildings matter a lot, uh, you know. So it's like. It, well, the the plots I was showing earlier, uh, we had basically sixty to seventy points uh, uh, per, uh, su you know, for the summer uh, to train our models. You know, and there's sort of, you know, and then there's like uh, the weather dependence. There's uh, uh, there's what was this, what was the set point control. And if I start making uh, distributed set point changes, I add much more degrees of freedom. So you know, the the, the number of um, uh, features that I have uh, that relative to the number of uh, observations is never going to be very good. You know, so so one of the things, one of the constraints here, if you like, on the on the data learning side, is how do you uh, build models that can learn from real data, but from limited amounts of real data. And that's that's a real so constraint. We're just about out of time. I can't uh, resist uh, adding. Uh, th these are a great set of questions. Uh, one thing that we we did have a seminar two years ago about the LA one hundred study by the mayor's office. They, uh, from what I understood, they've kind of done part of a lot, actually quite a bit of your supply side, but we're just starting to think about the demand side. The group that did a lot of their analytics was at NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab. So the, they, they do, I think they would agree, uh, confirm this, they do have pretty good data, so they, they may be more data uh, rich than most. Setting. So if you haven't talked to them, they'd probably love to talk to Can you. Can I comment on that? Oh, both sorry. LA and uh, NREL. The good question here about how do you do this elsewhere, uh, working with the NREL group, their big fear, that they would love to replicate what they did there. This is a little bit broader, but this would be a great way to accelerate the impacts of what they're already doing. It, there's, they're, they're doing kind of the whole list of things you guys worked out. So. Uh, LA got a lot of resources put in. I won't go where they got the money from, but it was very well funded. So the question is, if you go almost any other city in the U.S., you don't have quite the resources, but you can learn from LA on what works. You can go out with the, your your analysis, say here in hand, and convince people they don't really need more money, and if they do need a little bit of money, it's going to have a very good rate of very high rate of return. So I think this really is a way forward because it's IT stuff mostly and not thermo stuff, although it controls thermo stuff. It's pretty easy to do it fast in just the way you described it, or at least get not all of the benefits, but a lot of them immediately before you need to replace the buildings, which does take a long time. Anyways, thanks so much. That was a terrific talk. Great